I think I can uh, I, I can uh, um, start with the presentation. So welcome uh, everybody to the Bologna Joint Astrophysical uh, Colloquium, and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the speaker of today, Andrea Meloni. Uh, since about one year and a half, uh, Andrea is uh, the um, principal investigator of uh, Erosita. I'm sure he will tell the story on how we uh, became in, in this role. And uh, uh, he, he is uh, in this role that is uh, also now well uh, uh, known to the entire surface community. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, for the smaller community working on compact ob objects and uh, AGN, Andrea was uh, a very well uh, known and familiar since many, many years. He started his career in um, uh, Rome at the University of La Sapienza, working on theoretical aspects of uh, the stellar structure with Remo Ruffini. Then he moved for the PhD to uh, Cambridge, UK, working in the group of uh, Andy Fabian at the Institute of uh, Astrophysics. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, he worked mainly in, on observation and interpretation of spectrum variability of accreting uh, compact objects. Then uh, almost exactly 20 years ago, <laughs> he landed in the Munich uh, uh, area at the Munich, uh, at the Garching uh, campus. And uh, with a series of uh, different postdocs and fellowships in uh, three different institutes, uh, Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, uh, and the Excellence Cluster Universe of the uh, Technische Universität München. I, I think I, <laughs> I had all of them. Uh, he established the, himself as a leading researcher in the field of, uh, again, treating black holes, uh, AGN evolution, and the gen of galactic evolution. So uh, I think uh, many of you are very familiar <coughs> with the seminar work on the fundamental plane of uh, black hole accretion, but they also left the sign, let's say, on uh, other aspects uh, like a gen uh, synthesis evolution models uh, and uh, the uh, black hole, uh, M black hole M sigma relation at uh, high redshift. And uh, since 10 years, uh, almost, uh, is a staff member at uh, MP, uh, where he joined the Rosita team, and in particular was appointed uh, as a project scientist of Rosita. And uh, he created many aspects uh, of, of the mission, mostly at the beginning on the scientific profile, and also taking care, especially on the aspects of the spectroscopic follow up of uh, uh, Rosita sources. But then uh, he, he did uh, many, many more related to Rosita in these uh, years, uh, and I'm sure he will uh, um, present uh, uh, all the activities in these final crucial years uh, uh, in this talk uh, that is devoted uh, on the first results from uh, um, Erosita on SLG. So the stage is yours, Andrea, and um, uh, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marcello. That was the nicest introduction I have had in many, in many years. And, and thank you all for, for being here. Uh, it's a relatively simple task I have today for you to describe uh, SRG and Erosita uh, after a little bit more than two years of science operation. So I will go quickly through some basic technical characteristic uh, about the mission, the status of the mission and the operations, and then um, essentially spend most of my talk uh, giving you a series of relatively short highlights of various uh, early science results that we got uh, so far. But I will start with, uh, as uh, it's customary, with the motivation slide. So if you ask, why did we build Erosita? Um, the simplified answer that you give in this kind of occasions, and in fact, what you often have to do with funding agency, you distill to the simplest point uh, your goals has to do with cosmology and in particular clusters cosmology for i'm sure many of you know uh, much more than me what, what i'm talking about but for those of you who don't there is a simple illustration of the principle so and and i'm, I'm using here relatively old uh, for example uh, simulation data here on the left these are slices through and body dark matter simulations at different redshift, each column is a different epoch, uh, each row is a different cosmology, it doesn't really matter if you don't even know what this acronym stands for. The main point is that the uh, various simple statistics like the uh, correlation function or even simplest number density evolution of the dark matter distribution uh, quite sensitively depend 
uh, on the um, uh, cosmological setup. And in particular here, we are interested in to the uh, most massive structure that form. So the uh, knots of this filamentary structure. And so here the plot on the bottom right from this very uh, seminar review by Piero Rosati, Norman and Borgan in 2002. This shows the simplest possible statistic you can do out of this uh, simulation. So the number density, uh, cumulative number density above a given mass, halo mass, normalized to the redshift zero value. Essentially you are counting, you know, it's a counting exercise. And this plot shows how different the number counts of cluster are at high redshift once you have, uh, have used the local universe as your baseline. Notice this is a logarithmic scale, right? So the simplest idea is to use cluster and the simplest possible statistics you can do in order to discriminate cosmological model. Why you do it in x-rays? Well, as you probably know, these clusters are so massive that their VDL temperatures um, are, are very high and therefore any receive any, any uh, baryonic matter that is trapped within this collapsing structure would be heated to temperatures of millions of tens of millions of degrees. And at those temperatures, free free brain emission uh, peaks in X-rays. And, and this is well known to X-ray astronomers or astronomers in general that uh, clusters are bright X-ray sources, right? And so the exercise that we did uh, 15 years ago was to, uh, given the knowledge in the early 2000s about dark energy and dark matter, uh, to think of an experiment in which you uh, design an instrument which is sensitive enough to detect at least 100,000 cluster up to redshift one in order to beat down your um, statistical errors. But then to, at the same time, to build an instrument which uh, has uh, just good enough uh, point spread function so that the clusters which are extended in the sky can be distinguishing your X-ray images from point sources, which of course dominate the X-ray background. So in a sense, this will give you your requirements on both sensitivity and angular resolution. So this is, in a sense, was the origin of Irosita as an observatory. Uh, this was uh, proposed to the German Space Agency in 2007, funded then, and then in a bilateral agreement with the Russian Space Agency, the SRG, Spectrum Röntgen Gamma, with Irosita as its primary instrument, was then approved in 2009. Uh, for those of you who are in the business for long, uh, you probably remember there was another Spectrum X Gamma mission in the books. This was in the late 80s, uh, a Soviet led international X ray observatories. I mean, very different from the current one, uh, but um, that uh, plan did not survive the funding crisis of the Russian space science after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was only revived in the early 2000s. Um, Key figures are here illustrated. Uh, Michael Pavlinsky, who sadly passed away last year, he had been the principal investigator or the other scientific payload called Artex C. Uh, there was design and built in our partner institute in Moscow, the ICI, the um, Space Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Science. Rashid Sunyaev, that I'm sure many of you know, he has been the lead scientist of SRG in Russia for the past 15, 20 years. And Peter Predel, who had been the PI of Irosita uh, since the very beginning until July of last year, as Marcello was mentioned, when I, I took his uh, position. And then here I want to mention also Paul Nandra, the director of the MPI Energy Group, which share with, with Rashid and Peter most of the uh, mission uh, management uh, and high profile roles. Irosita was built in Germany, supported by the German Space Agency, the Max Planck Society, by this group of uh, small group of universities. And uh, our institute, MPE, we did the scientific leadership of the mission, most of, the, if not all, of the project management, but also uh, the entire instrument design and the manufacturing of a large part of the, of the flying parts. We did all the integration and test in our premises. And now we are doing data handling, processing, and archive. So even for a big institute like MP, this was a really huge uh, enterprise. 
So this is a picture of the hardware just a few days before it was sent to space from Baikonur. Um, what you see here are the two X-ray telescope, the Artex C that operates at energy between five and um, 30 kilo electron volt. It's a smaller telescope with longer focal length for hard X-ray focusing uh, objective. And that's Irosita, which is the largest of the two telescope uh, here uh, on top. These two telescopes point to the same direction on the sky. They are mounted on uh, a platform that connects them to the spacecraft. Navigator is the name of the spacecraft produced by the Anpol Lavochkin company in Russia. Here you see the folded solar panel. The uh, so the spacecraft provide power and means of communication with ground. And, and in this picture, they are mounted on the upper stage of the rocket that brought uh, uh, SRG into orbit. So now focusing on Irosita, picture without the cover so that you can better understand the main structure of the hardware. So in fact, uh, Irosita is not just one X-ray telescope, but in a, a, an array of seven identical mirror module or telescopes, which focus X-rays using the standard Volter one uh, <coughs> grazing incidence uh, technology. So the mirrors of Irosita uh, are a direct heritage of XMM uh, Newton uh, technology development, and they were made in Italy, in fact, by Medialario, a company near Lecco. Uh, and they provide XMM-like optics, so um, half energy width uh, of 18 hours second on axis. In fact, the native uh, energy width is bad, more like 16, but with the focus it a little bit to get a better field of view average uh, PSF. So the alpha energy width is 30 arc second uh, in terms of full width of maximum. If you want this, correspond to about 15 arc second, which, which allow us to position point sources in the sky to about 4.5 arc second on sigma. And, and this is kind of the, for these lightweight optics is the state of the art you can do. Uh, and we are limited by the desire of having a large field of view. So compared to XMM, as I will show you later, we have about one degree diameter. The PSF degrades very badly as you move away from the optical axis. These are images taken at Panther during our calibration campaign, just to illustrate the problem that we have with this kind of uh, focusing uh, technologies uh, at the off axis. And, uh, one other characteristic is that we have built uh, X-ray baffles aligned to the mirror uh, that are basically in front here in order to reduce uh, stray light and help us getting a uh, good handle on, uh, let's say, faint diffuse emission. On the right hand side, you see the focal plane. So the seven identical mirror focus on seven cameras. And again, here we are talking about uh, a development uh, on the XMM Newton heritage. So we are using PN CCDs, the PN camera for those of you who have worked with an XMM Newton is the most powerful of the XMM cameras. Uh, with respect to the XMM one, we had made some improvement. Uh, so there is a frame store where we, we can shift the charges while uh, we read. So there are no out of time events. The cameras are fully illuminated. This is one example of one blank, if you want. So there are no chip gaps and they're very uniform as you can already see by this map. Uh, they also have very little temperature dependence. Pixel size is about nine arc second. And in total over the seven cameras, we have almost exactly 1 million pixel. Um, and thanks to the development, the improvement in the camera CCD technology, we achieved uh, spectral resolution, which is almost a factor of two, maybe factor 1.6 to 1.8 better than XMM Newton. Nominally is almost resolution 20 at 1.5 kilo electron volt. Uh, so, just one more illustration of the main characteristic. This is now a plot of the field of view average effective area as a function of energy. That a plot that tells you how big a telescope we built, right? And red is the seven Erosita mirror combined. In blue, these are XMM, PN, and MOS. You have green in Chandra at launch and Chandra now, then uh, rose at and uh, the Chandra HRC. So effectively in the soft energy range between uh, let's say 0.3 to 2.3 kilo electron volt, um, 
the erosita uh, mirror system is as large as XMM Newton. In fact, maybe slightly larger at one kilo electron volt. So it's a, a big, I mean, the biggest operating X-ray telescope at soft X-ray energies. Um, but the main, and, and, and I mean, I think this is important to keep in mind, especially if you consider what I told you before, that we have a significantly larger field of view compared to any of the other powerful X-ray focusing telescope. Here is a comparison between the Chandra field of view, the XMM Newton field of view here on the left, and the Erosita one. Um, so this immediately translates into a survey speed or grasp, uh, which is about five times larger than XMM Newton and about 100 times larger than Chandra today. Okay, so for the, if your main metric is how fast you can uh, go uh, to a given depth over a large area of the sky, we are definitely the fastest survey telescope operating right now. And in terms of image quality, one other aspect I would like to mention is that SRG has implemented a raster scan mode of observation beyond the classical uh, pointing observation or survey scan that I will describe later on. With raster scan, you can uh, cover rectangular areas of the sky of any given shape uh, of size up to 150 square degrees without having to uh, point at stair. And these allow you to build very uniform large exposure, uh, which is not that common for X-ray telescope. And this is one beautiful example of a few square degree wide field uh, that Erosita took as one of the first, very first image in the calibration phase, uh, centered on the interacting cluster about 33, I will get back to this field later. Okay, um, launch was uh, in July, 2019 uh, with the Proton rocket from Baikonur. Uh, it went perfectly. So it delivered SRG into the nominal expected orbit around L2. So we are the first X-ray mission operating around L2. Uh, I mean, we are not at L2. We have this very wide, large orbit uh, around the halo orbit around L2. So that needs continuous repeated corrections in order to keep your system at that uh, orbit, which is a, uh, not a stable one. And um, a few words about the instrument status right now. Essentially, everything is working if you want to have the bottom line. So you see mostly green here. Um, the uh, few orange, uh, so non green points have to do with the cooling system. We have a passive uh, cooling system of the cameras that was supposed to operate around minus 90 degrees. However, to, due to some uh, probable malfunction on some of the heat pipes that connects the radiators with the camera. We are now currently operating between minus 85 and minus 82, probably closer to minus 85. This has really no significant impact on the uh, quality of the camera data, but it may affect in the long term the um, um, radiation, the susceptibility to radiation damage over many years. But this right now doesn't seem to be a big issue, in fact. Um, we have some issues with camera electronics in the sense that uh, um, they suffer from uh, periodic uh, malfunction due to interaction with cosmic rays. We knew that we would have some of this problem because of our firmware is not completely uh, radiation redundant. Uh, this uh, typically uh, make us lose a few hours of camera data every week. Uh, in total, maybe a few percent, two to three percent of observing time is lost in this way. But the camera uh, just need to be reset in a few minutes and we don't seem to see any degradation in their performance in the electronics. We have had already three micrometeroid impacts or even maybe four still don't know about the latest one. So this is more than the one that XMM Newton had in these 20 plus years of operations. One in particular was pretty bad. It was a big event with probably a large the, uh, series of debris or, or, or sputtering. So we, we, we lost a few columns, you know, one column, uh, well, maybe two, 
in total of the order of a few thousand, I don't know if 3,800 is still the up, up to date number, but we lost a few pixels, a few thousand pixels in one of our uh, telescope module camera four. And in the, the other events were very marginal. We lost only eight uh, in one case and 38 pixels in the other case. But statistics is very low, but you know it's probably something interesting to understand the L2 environment. And the another problem that we have is due to some design fault. We have two of our seven cameras. They don't have an on-chip filter and they are affected by uh, light leak. This is solar light that scattered through uh, the cameras, which are clearly not perfectly uh, light tight. This does not really affect your X-ray imaging at all. These are essentially UV photon, extreme UV photons, but uh, the illumination of the camera changed the energy response of it. So uh, calibration, energy calibration of these two cameras is very difficult. So spectroscopy with these two cameras is very difficult. Um, okay. One word about the background or maybe two. The, this is uh, um, a light curve taken maybe the first year and a half of uh, medium ionizing particle, uh, which are reject, we reject on board um over the first year and a half of the mission there is a broad uh, plateau peak which corresponds to solar minimum this is well known that the rate of cosmic rays at l2 anti correlates with solar activity um but and then there are some other interesting facts like this 26 day modulation uh which is probably connected to the solar rotation cycle this is almost identical gaia is almost the same thing um, I mean, I don't know an, enough about the um, magnetosphere physics uh, around L2, but I think that's uh, quite some, we are collecting quite some interesting data. What I would like you to pay attention is that this level of modulation or even this plateau is very small. So it's just, we are talking about a 5% level here, it's a linear axis. So in, overall, the main message of this you can gain is the background level is very stable at L2. You can see also here, is uh, the equipartition. Um, that's what, uh, what is uh, at least the standard panel material. Otherwise, uh, we will not. Uh, uh, please, uh, can you switch off the microphone? Okay. There is some. Okay, okay. I, 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 okay, okay. I thought there was a question. But it's no, no, no. Uh, okay. it's, uh, Trigger the, the original observations of what the Okay. I, I don't have the, the, the power to uh, uh, switch on switch off the microphone. Marina, I don't know who is uh, all over the volume, then you expect. Okay, thank you. Good. Go ahead, Andrea, so, so here you see on the right a plot uh, of a simultaneous observation uh, of a field so between with the Rosita and XMM. This is the light curve of the background in three different energy range. The Rosita is red, XMM is blue and green, just to illustrate the, the better stability of the Rosita background. The downside of that is that compared to our pre-flight estimate, now I'm looking at this plot on the left that shows the spectrum of the background accumulated over about six months. And the blue is what but we measure. And the, this is a the, the it's a combination of the cosmic background uh, and, and foreground, which is this black curve. So Milky Way diffuse emission plus cosmic X-ray background and the particle background in red. And this is what the essential interaction of, of cosmic rays and particle with our instrument. And this is about a factor of three higher than our pre-flight estimates. Part of that is due to a uh, maybe not so accurate modeling of the uh, instrument. Part of it is due to the fact that we operated uh, solar minimum during these observations, so maximum background level. Uh, and and uh, I think that's most of the issues. But anyway, it's it's a bit higher that that uh, reduce our sensitivity at higher energies where the particle background dominates. So you see about, about two kilo electron volt, the level of the background is dominated by the particle level and um, these affect our sensitivity at higher energies. Okay, I think that was my brief overview of technicalities. 
One last word is about the programmatics. Um, we launched, as I said, in, in July 2019. We spent about three months during calibration and performance verification observations. Uh, the data, uh, I will show you some nice results from this early phase of the mission and the data associated to that, at least for the observation that uh, the German consortium led, had been released to the public in July with an uh, associated splash of papers. Uh, in December 2019, we started the Old Sky Survey, which is our main program for the next uh, few years. Um, and we are now close to completing the fourth Old Sky Survey. Sorry, there, there is a typo here. And the plan is to do two more years of Old Sky Survey, so completing eight Old Sky Survey uh, by the end of 2023, after which there will be a, a, at least a two and a half years of pointed observation. Part of this will be GTO consortium uh, uh, proprietary time, and part of it will be open to the community for, for proposals. And the Old Sky Survey data are planned to be released periodically starting from the end of next year, about every 18 months, so that the full Old Sky Survey pro data will be released around 2026. Okay, so I want to start with some highlight. This is a picture that was taken the night of our first light observation. This is the com control room at MPE. You see the seven screen, the screen with the seven images coming from the seven telescopes. When you combine those images, you get this beautiful, this beautiful first light image of the LMC. Right, the Large Magellanic Cloud. In particular, we are looking at a, a, an area around Supernova 1987A. This is the bright point source at the center. It looks extended just because it's very bright and it feels it's PSF. Uh, but you know, you appreciate in this false color image. This is pure X-rays, right? They act, uh, uh, color coded by the energy of the photons, with red being lowest energy between half a kV and one kV, and blue being the higher energies between, let's say, two and four and green the intermediate range. This is actually the first light image of XMM Newton, which uh, was also in the LMC. 1987A was less bright in 21, is still increasing now or, or almost plateauing in fact. And you appreciate the image, the XMM Newton is slightly sharper, but you know the advantage of the large field of view is clear from this image. It allows you to trace the hot ISM of the Magellanic Cloud the interaction of uh, hot winds, supernova remnants like this one, uh, bright uh, sources in the clouds and behind the clouds uh, that you can use to study the physical property of the gas in the LMC. Um, so these are a few of images that we took during the uh, CalPV. And here you find the link to our early data release page where you can access those data or read the papers associated to them. Uh, one of the most beautiful is this uh, supernova remnant called Cupris A. It's one of the brightest X-ray supernova remnants. And it's this image is about uh, one and a half to two square degree on a side. So it's a very nice uh, illustration of the advantage of the large field of view. Uh, and again, this is a false color image in which color give you uh, an idea of the energy of the photons. There is a very nice paper by a student at MP, uh, Michael Mayer, that describe how you can use the Hirozita spectra in different regions of the supernova remnant uh, to study the propagation, uh, the, the expansion of the supernova shells and different elements and so on. Uh, this is again the first light image of the LMC, uh, uh, complemented with few other deep pointing around them. And uh, here I just want to uh, show the spectrum that you extract from uh, the supernova remnant itself, 1987A, just to illustrate the comparison uh, between the Erosita spectral resolution and the XMM Newton PN spectral resolution. It's maybe a little bit unfair comparison because the XMM Newton observation we use here was shorter than the Erosita one. So the statistics is better, but beyond the smallest of the error bytes, I think I would like you to pay attention to the sharpness of the lines from different elements in the eject of the supernova remnant that, of course, helps you tremendously in, in, in better constraining the physics of the supernova expansion. 
Okay, what, another couple of pretty pictures. Of course, we have this uh, ambitious uh, cluster cosmology goal. So clusters of galaxy were some of our prime targets during CalPV. Here you see on the left, uh, so these are now relatively uh, very famous objects, uh, which serves multiple purposes. One is to show beautiful image, demonstrate the capability of the instrument and also cross calibrate it against XMM or Chandra. So one of these is ABLE 3266, is a merging cluster. The Rosita image, uh, false color is, is here in the background. And uh, Jeremy Sanders that led this uh, very nice work uh, was able to extract spectra from relatively small pixel given taking advantage of the large collecting area of Rosita. This observation was about 80 kiloseconds long. And so he could determine uh, um, temperature and density of the hot emitting gas in small areas and so for and then produce these beautiful entropy maps and temperature maps i mean i'm showing here the entropy map that highlights the disturbance and how complex the merging process in clusters is and and directly traced by the hot x-ray gas of course another famous and important target was coma uh, in coma in this paper led by eugene churatsov et al we use our raster scan to cover a very wide area uh, well beyond the video radius. So this is five degree in diameter. And um, these are the X-ray uh, uh, intensity profile. If you subtract uh, uh, central profile, you can highlight uh, the disturbances of the gas. This is the Rosita image after subtracting the central profile. And uh, you see uh, two shocks uh, probably and a clear interaction between NGC 4839 and the main body of the Coma Coma cluster. And there are very beautiful images in, in Eugene's paper and I think uh, very promising synergies with uh, deep radio observation like LOFAR uh, for studying uh, in detail the uh, CG, uh, ICM physics of clusters. Okay, uh, I think I need to speed up a little bit. I, I promise you to go back to Ebert 391.95. This is not the Erosita image, it's the Rosa Sky survey image of this triple interacting system. This is the XMM Newton pointings, one center in the northern cluster, one in the southern uh, system, and one in the middle. And that's the full, uh, well, actually not the full, but it's the central part of the Erosita 0.222 kV. Um, observation. Uh, this was taken again in this raster scan mode. We covered about 10 square degree in total to an average depth of 20 kiloseconds, maybe a little bit more in the center. Um, if we take the full image, so zooming out a little bit, so it's again the same system, same energy range, now with a little extra um, wavelet filtering to uh, enhance the diffuse structures. What is really intriguing is that beyond this uh, uh, main uh, able 339195 interacting system, we have detected at least uh, half a dozen other extended sources at the same redshift of this interacting system. So if you want, we have in a single image, the view of the filamentary large scale structure coming together with these groups probably moving towards the central system of the cluster, which is about to merge. And, and uh, in a nice paper led by Veronica Biffy, uh, they had uh, searched through hydrodynamical simulation for system that look like in projection, uh, like the real ABLE 339195. And they've chosen this one. And this illustrates the uh, advantage of having um, detection over several times the video radius of this system. So here, three times uh, 200. And uh, in this particular color scheme, you, play, you can see uh, excess emission that connects this northern clump, the southern clump, and the two merging clusters. Uh, so uh, in, in a series of papers, uh, the one led by Thomas Freiprich et al. So this has been, they argue that, in fact, we have evidence for a large filament detected directly in the X-ray images. And then for radio astronomers here in the audience, we have a nice paper led by Marcus Bruggen where uh, deep ASCAP, the observation were taken of this field. 
we didn't detect diffuse emission, uh, radio diffuse emission, um, at least not uh, either shocks or, 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 or classical halos, but plenty of beautiful radio galaxies clearly interacting with the ISM, and in particular, this uh, bent uh, or head tail radio galaxy associated to this northern clump uh, that is clearly moving towards uh, the triple interacting cluster system. We got extra XMM observation, and there is a paper by Angie Veronica that described the radio and the XMM data together. So I think this is nice potential for future combin com uh, combined study of X-ray and radio with future facilities. The largest investment of time during our CalPV phase was, was actually mini survey, not an individual uh, special field, but a blank field, an equatorial field uh, called EFETS uh, around uh, gamma nine, nine hour gamma field. So it, it was chosen, of course, to have very good multivalent data. And it was uh, chosen, uh, so the observation were performed to a depth of about two kilosecond, uh, 2.5 kilosecond X-ray exposure, which is slightly deeper than what we expect to have over the old sky at the end of the old sky survey program. So it's kind of a preview of how the X-ray sky will look like after it was it has completed this program. And for us, it was an important test of our workflow. So in our ability to detect sources, identify their counterparts, measure redshift and extract science, you know, survey science from uh, these observations. And here you see a list of papers that we come out, we, we put out describing the survey field. Um, so there are many pot potential highlights I could give. I want to start with this nice image. It's again, the same 0.2 to 2.3 erosita, uh, KV erosita image at which point sources have been subtracted. And basically you see the extended large, the, the large scale structure tracing traced by clusters and groups. And thanks to the, uh, uh, the depth of the uh, multi-wavelength data in this field, we can identify the counterpart of almost 500 clusters in this area and measure their photometric redshift, in some cases even spectroscopically. So thanks to that, we can identify clusters of clusters or super cluster. For example, this high redshift or redshift 0.4, almost redshift 0.4, supercluster that Vittorio Ghirardini reported in a paper in 2021, or just simply uh, project into the 3D, in a 3D wedge-like representation, the location of these clusters and how they can be then used to trace the large scale structure. So under many point of view, and I don't even have the time to discuss uh, mass calibration using lensing and so on, but there are many papers that describe how we, we can demonstrate the ability of Erosita to use, to do cluster surveys and uh, move towards cluster cosmology goals. Of course, most of the sources, sorry, that you see in this image are point-like. These are not clusters, are only a small majority. We have about almost 30,000 sources detected in the survey field, which makes EFETS the largest contiguous um, X-ray survey field ever done, that's just, just in terms of sheer number of sources, it, with, the, of course, the exception of the old sky and survey. So uh, then we can characterize the point sources, for example, using optical infrared color. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but in this particular space, this is G minus R versus Z minus W1, coming from legacy survey and wise, uh, we can clearly separate stellar sources from extragalactic sources and within the extragalactic population which is the blue we can separate quasar like object which is this big cloud from uh, galaxies of different uh, uh, optical type so the x-ray selection is quite democratic you get uh, of course a lot of agn and quasars but also uh, lower luminosity systems and, and nearby galaxies and stars so the the stellar uh, exploitation is interesting in itself. This is a Gaia Hertzsprung Russell diagram of the X ray detected stars in EFETS. And uh, these are important because they trace uh, mainly these are coronally active main sequence stars. So they trace young, rapidly rotating with strong stars with strong magnetic fields. So it's an interesting subpopulation, um, uh, which we will gonna have in large numbers in our survey. 
when you look at the extragalactic sky, of course, the advantage of this field is that we have good either spectroscopic or photometric redshift. And so we can build the machinery to study the evolution of these black holes over a very wide redshift range. And we have, in fact, detected a couple of redshift six quasars. One has already published, and one will be published soon blindly in this survey field. OK, there was the, my two of the first. Yes, uh, I guess I will take maybe uh, five more to give you, well, between 12 and 15 is what I need still to give you an overview of what the Old Sky Survey has been doing. Um, as I said, we start in, in December, and since then, essentially, SRG has been operating in this mode, as you can see in this animation. It's a slow rotating mode. Uh, it takes about four hours to do a great circle, so it moves by about 90 degrees per hour. And uh, in doing so, essentially, you follow the motion of the L2 point around the sun. And because we have a one degree field of view and the uh, L2 advanced by one degree per day, in about half a year, we have completed the North Sky. And here you see on the right, this is not an animation. These are now real data that show how we accumulate. It's, it's basically a cumulative uh, map around the south ecliptic pole where all these great circles inter intersect. So at the ecliptic poles, we have essentially a data point every four hours. And the plan is to do this kind of uh, mission plan for the for four years. So in, in four years, you get eight independent pictures of the old sky. A few numbers about the first old sky survey, but this will be similar. Uh, each of them have very similar uh, profiles. So the, the exposure, I said, is very high at the ecliptic poles. It, it goes up to maybe 10 hours worth of data. Typically, however, most of the sky is only covered with about 200 second exposure. So it's pretty shallow. But of course, because the telescope is big, this corresponds to sensitivity, point source sensitivity in the 0.3 to 2.3 kilo electron volt range of about 5 times 10 to minus 14. Um, in the first world case survey, at least, or at least in the first two and a half, we almost didn't have any background flare. The background was very stable. Things are changing now that the solar cycle is going up. But at least in the first two and a half surveys, we essentially had no background flares. And, the, and, and we could close all the gap that were there because of orbit correction maneuvers and other problems with the cameras. So we had no gap in the exposure of the old sky so far in any of our surveys. To give you an idea of the volume, data volume, one old sky survey corresponds to about 400 million calibrated photons in the range between 0.12 and 5 kilo electron volt. Above that, these are mainly background. So these are um, useful photons, if you want, that correspond to about 80 gigabyte total of data. And in the preliminary analysis of the old sky survey, we have run our source detection, preliminary source detection. We are now refining that. Uh, but we know that there are about 1 million X-ray sources detected over the old sky, of which, roughly speaking, given the knowledge of the organ log S, 80% are AGN and 20% are stars, uh, and, and about 15 to 20,000 clusters. So 1 million is a nice number, but it's also a good milestone because it doubles the number of known X-ray sources uh, we, we knew of about a million sources before Rosita launch from Rosa, from, from everything, from all the extra mission before. And so every old sky survey we do, we, we, we discover new sources in, in the same number. This is now a map of the old sky from Rosita that comes from the first old sky survey. This particular map only focuses on photons above one kilo electron volt. And the reason for doing that is. Above one kilo electron volt, you have very little contamination from diffuse gas in the Milky Way. The typical temperature of the Milky Way halo, the video temperature is a few million degree, so it should produce photons at lower energy. So above one kV, you only have the hottest tail of the ISM. Of course, some of it clearly is visible in the in the plane of the galaxy. This is, of course, a, a galactic uh, projection, so the Milky Way is horizontal. The galactic center is at the center of this image, but mostly be, uh, this image looks quite uniform. 
simply because the sky had those energies dominated by the cosmic X-ray background over cosmological distances. One interesting thing is that, of course, beyond this kind of diffuse uh, uniform background, you see sources, because this is a smoothed image, most of what you see are extended sources. And if you overlay the local galaxy uh, sample, so this is a, a two mass redshift survey. So these are massive galaxies that trace the local large scale structure. In this particular slice, I've taken only galaxy up to 88 megaparsec, so relatively nearby ones. But if you pay attention, uh, at the structure traced by the large the, the galaxies and the structure you see in the Irazita sky, you clearly see the same. I mean, this is Virgo, the great attractor, Shapley superclusters. These are all visible in the Irazita map. In fact, okay, now I'm taking the full two mass redshift survey up to redshift point zero eight, with marked all the famous uh, superstructures and superclusters. Uh, those of you who do near field astronomy would know them by art, but then I keep the labeling and I put back the Irosita image. And essentially at every, at the location of every of these famous superstructure, you see them in the X-ray map that itself, which I think is quite nice. Okay, so this is the hard, okay. This is the harder part of our sensitive energy band. If you go at the opposite, uh, lowest energy between 0.3 and 0.6 kV, the picture is very different. Now what you see are soft X-rays. They are more absorbed by Milky Way dust and gas. So you see a lot of black uh, cloud in that obscure the view. And you see much more structure and much more diffuse, diffused structure because now we are looking at the combination of the local hot bubble and probably some of the ISM or CGM of the Milky Way including you know some structure profiles uh, but this is even more clear if we get now get to the intermediate energy band between 0.6 and 1 kV this is at the temperature where Bremsstrahlung gas emitting at the virial temperature of the Milky Way halo should emit so it's a particularly interesting energy band and so you see now a combination of hot ISM uh, dark uh, uh, clouds and structure of the CGM or ISM. And of course, in particular, what we noticed immediately was this bubble-like structure in the south. The north polar spool was known to X-ray astronomers since Rosa time, but the southern counterpart of it was not, never seen so clearly. In fact, there were some hints in uh, Suzaku maps uh, published before, but that was very immediately rem reminiscent of the Fermi bubbles, right? So. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Fermi bubbles have been discovered uh, more than 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. And these are hard uh, gamma ray structures, hard meaning typically they emerge above 1 GeV. And they're very clearly if you do an hardness ratio of the Fermi sky. So this plot on the bottom show uh, the ratio of uh, gamma photons above 3 GeV over those at below 3 GeV. And you see these bubbles very clearly emanating from the galactic center. So you can take the uh, Fermi image above 1 GeV and overlay it with the Rosita image in the 0.1 to 0.6 to 1 kilo electron volt. And you see the in red is Fermi with these Fermi bubbles clearly emerging. And the cyan is the Rosita. And we have, so we, we, we immediately thought that we were looking at larger bubbles traced by the hot gas uh, in Rosita. You can even see now I'm going back to the Rosita intermediate energy band. Now this image has been, all point sources have been subtracted. Some smoothing have been done to emphasize uh, the, large, the large structure. And you see quite sharp uh, edged bubbles in the south and in the north. So the simplest interpretation we could put forward is that these structure emanate from the galactic center like the Fermi bubble. And in fact, they represent together probably some, I mean, one possible explanation of what we're seeing is something like a, a gigantic version of stellar wind in which the Fermi bubble themselves represent the shock hot wind material. The Fermi bubble edge are simple contact discontinuity and uh, with the shock ISM uh, and the Rosita bubbles themselves represent the shock front. So in, with this interpretation, you can do some energetics 
The total X-ray luminosity of this bubble is about 10 to the 39 X per second. So put in a distant galaxy, they would not be that easy to detect. Um, the total energy is about 10 times the Fermi bubble at 10 to the 56 ergs or 10,000 or more supernovae. And the, just using some estimate of the X-ray temperature, um, we can estimate a Mach number and the shock expansion velocity, which give an age of this structure to a few tens of million years. And that would then, you can turn it to an energy requirement uh, of energy power of about a few times 10 to 41 x per second, which is easily done by a relatively weak AGN episode that could have happened in the past or uh, an, an older starburst. Um, okay, so that was our probably first highlight from the Old Sky Survey. Now I'm putting back all these three images together in this beautiful RGB uh, in which you appreciate the level of details that this Old Sky, uh, X ray Old Sky map can provide. And there are, of course, not just large scale structure, there are plenty of interesting, well known sources from nearby clusters to famous X ray binary like Sigmus X1. Scorpius X1, Crab, um, beautiful supernova remnants like Vila, uh, Cas A. Um, and in fact, if you zoom in closely enough, I can assure you there is even a point source which corresponds to Redshift 3 quasar in this image. Uh, one, of, I think this is just too beautiful not to show it. I'm now zooming onto Vila just to give you some idea of the variety of the, of the science you can do with this old sky survey data. So the region around the Vila Pulsar and the Vila supernova remnant is interesting because there are actually three supernova remnants in projection. These are not connected to each other. They happen to be one behind each other. Vila is the oldest. Uh, it's mainly thermal. Uh, it's also the largest because it's nearby. There is another one which is very different. It's called Vila Junior. You can hopefully barely see this bluish circle here. Uh, that shows that uh, it's much harder. It's, it has much harder emission. It's typically a non-thermal younger supernova remnant. And then there is Kupise, which happens to lie close to Vila that I showed you already before. Another highlight from completely moving to something completely different. Uh, out of our 20,000 star in the first sky survey, we detect about 10% of all planet hosting stars outside of the Kepler field. And there is a nice uh, paper by uh, Grace Foster from Potsdam uh, in the group of Katja Poppenegger. Some of the things they highlight among these uh, various detection is an exotic system of a nearby multi-planet system with three Neptunic planets. So the fact that we now know that the central star is X-ray emitting is important to understand the process of uh, atmosphere evaporation and uh, in general, planet life sustainability. So with the large number of new Erosita detection of planet hosting stars, we enter into a different phase in which you can do statistics of uh, interaction between um, hot stellar flares and planet atmospheres. And the last thing I want to say in two minutes is about the time domain, okay? Because we are doing this survey in this peculiar way, we are opening up interesting parameter space in time domain science. This slide is supposed to just illustrate the point that we don't get contact with the spacecraft 24 seven, but we only get data once per day in, in a contact that lasts a few hours. So 24 hour worth of data are telemeter down and pass through our system uh, that does earth, earth check and analysis. And so typically once per day, uh, we can uh, we can uh, trigger whenever we detect uh, sources that varied compared to the previous uh, sky model, and we get about 100 150 automatic triggers per day. So it's quite a large number that has to be humanly vetted before you get to something interesting. Most of these triggers are typically stellar flares, but there are a few interesting things. And the other element here, I, I, just because I, before I show you one highlight of what we have discovered using time domain, 
uh, information is the rel relative time scale, which are important. So 50 millisecond is the time resolution of HCCD is our frame readout time. So we cannot detect anything faster than that. 40 seconds is the time it takes a source to, to go through our field of view during these continuous scans. Uh, and so it's, a, it's also the unit of exposure that we have. And then four hours it is uh, the time it takes between overlapping scans. A source typically is observed in six consecutive scans because our scans have large overlap with each other. So we have typically six to seven data points every four hours and then within one day. And then this, we leave that source and we come back to it every six months. So we can study variability on hours time scale or months time scales. So one of the months time scale more interesting variability is shown in this image. At the center of this image, there is an X-ray transient that was in outburst before Erosita uh, observed the first World Sky Survey. It, I'm now showing uh, an animation in which the image of the first two World Sky Survey are compared to each other. This beautiful ring that is seen in the first OK survey fades out and, and gets larger in the second, and in the third completely disappears. Plus, you see quite a number of other variables, uh, variable stars in this image. But of course, what caught our attention was this beautiful ring. And what this is due to is scattering uh, of X-ray photons against dust lane along the line of sight. And uh, just like a normal projection, the, the scattered light takes longer to get, and, and we see it as a distant echo of the transient. So if you know the time of the outburst of the central source, and if you know the distance of the dust scattering screen, you can estimate the distance to the transient itself. And this is what was done in this paper by Georg Lammer, using Gaia to study the dust distribution along this line of sight, placing the dust scattering screen at about two uh, kiloparsec, and the source itself is about three kiloparsec. Uh, and th this is one, in fact, one of the best known distance to an X-ray binary ever. And because of that, we can constrain, people can constrain the mass of the black hole in this X-ray binary R, or the luminosity at which uh, that in, in Eddington unit at which the peak was reached. The and the other, done. <laughs> yes, so the other highlight I would like to report is uh, this nuclear transient. So now we are talking about transient, not in the Milky Way, but in a distant galaxy. And this was particularly peculiar because you see this light curve, each data point was taken every four hours. And so here you have a source which is consistent with the background and then there is an outburst. And then again, four hours later is consistent with the background. And then again, is visible. The source location pinpointed by a follow-up XMM is clearly associated to the nucleus of a redshift point one galaxy. This galaxy spectrum doesn't show any AGN activity before. And we have two objects like this one. Uh, and these are the follow-up light curve. The bottom line is the NXMM light curve of a source that have periodic outbursts of 10 to the 42 eggs per second every few hours. So quite, quite impressive. And then I, the, this one is the, the same source I shown you before in which we use NICER for 11 days in intense monitoring. And so we can see the source going into essentially one outburst per day. And these outbursts are almost 10 to the 43 eggs per second luminous at peak. So these are clearly supermassive black hole of uh, uh, in small galaxies. So this is the stellar mass and star formation rate of the host of these two quasi-periodic systems in blue and red. So these are small galaxies. So we are talking probably of a supermassive black hole of 10 to the 5 of 10 to the 6 solar masses maximum. Uh, but we still don't know what is causing these quasi-periodic eruptions. In the paper led by a student here at MP, Ricardo Arcodia in Nature, we put forward, we, we, we could exclude the classical radiation pressure instability of the inner accretion flow, flow because the, the duty cycle simply does not correspond to the predicted expected duty cycle. Uh, but we would forward some alternative possibility having to do with interaction between a star or a compact object and, and the supermassive black hole. And there have been a few more papers following up our discoveries. Uh, I, of course, I need to mention these QP were already been discovered before. There were two known in the literature before we discovered these two, and we are now at five. So, and Erosita is very well suited to find a few more. But this is definitely something a spot to keep an eye on. Uh, 
the, for potential fu future discoveries. Okay, so I, I really need to wrap up. Uh, my, my conclusion are that Erositon SRG is in operation since more than two years and all sy subsystems are working with minimal losses. We have almost completed four old sky survey and we have a bit more than four to go. Uh, and of course, as, I will as I've shown you, the large grasp and stable background and observing cadence uh, of Erosita opens up new parameter space for X-ray astronomy across source classes. So really this is not just something useful for cluster cosmology. But we have demonstrated through EFETs that we have strong capabilities to classical survey science, uh, including our cluster cosmology goals. And uh, the completed old sky survey will represent for sure a legacy data set that will be useful and unsurpassed for many years. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Andrea, very much. In fact, we, we finished the entire, almost the entire hour at our disposal, but I think that, uh, I mean, there, there is uh, some time for uh, at least a few questions. The talk was uh, um, presenting very well all the capabilities of Rosita and the force results. So I see the hands up from Stefano, uh, Stefano Ettore, and then Lorenzo Lovisari. So let's start with Stefano. Hey, Charles, Andrea, and thanks for a very nice talk, a beautiful talk. Um, about the EFETs, I mean, um, I have several questions, but I would like just to focus on EFETs. Will be used also from a Russian side to test uh, their code for cluster detection and characterization. And if not, uh, if there is any plan to, uh, to do this uh, kind of comparison between the different techniques. And then about the purity, because uh, it is uh, definitely one of the concerns in building this kind of catalogs, uh, particularly cluster catalogs, um, to assess the purity of your of your sample and the contaminants are several and uh, and uh, will be very difficult to assess and to quantify uh, this effect. So if there is any plan uh, already, for instance, uh, using different technique for detection or whatever. Yes. Thanks. So yes, uh, Charles, definitely. No. I don't know about uh, using EFETs for for cross checking the detection pipelines, but we do have a plan. To do, I mean, we, we have um, an area of about one degree wide stripe in the survey, which bound at the boundary between the uh, German and Russian part of the sky. And uh, we are now thinking to uh, run each other's uh, source detection algorithm in the same part of the sky and compare the results. Uh, this will be on the old sky survey and probably on something like the ERAS-3 or ERAS-4 depth data. So it's not as deep as EFETs. Uh, but of course, EFETs data are public. So of course they could, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether they have planned to do it, but they could uh, do that exercise. With respect to purity, we have spent quite some time in, in, in trying to get uh, simulations to guide us towards understanding the purity. Um, we'll spend time, not just computing time, but also time to think of how to build realistic uh, uh, sky simulation, including uh, clusters. Um, whether these are the ultimate uh, simulation, I don't know, but they are very useful. And for example, thanks to those, we know already that at the EFET step with the algorithm we were using, the cluster sample is something between 16 and 20 percent contaminant, contaminated. So there are something of the order of 16 to 20 percent either misclassified point sources or simply spurious, spurious detections. And uh, we do have uh, a, a, a challenge ongoing, a cluster finding challenge in which we test different uh, source detection algorithms. Um, we haven't found a silver bullet yet. Uh, some, and, and so we are right now, what we published was based on relatively standard EML, L detect, XMM inherited algorithm, not, nothing too sophisticated, but there, the cover is always a bit short somewhere. So you, uh, the trade off between purity and completeness have to be looked carefully. But we do have some uh, simulations at hand for that. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lorenzo Luizari? Sì, ciao Andrea. 
Uh, can you say a few words about the cross calibration between the seven detectors and uh, between uh, in terms of both of flux and temperature and also uh, with respect to XMM and Chandra? Yes. And uh, related to that, uh, um, can you say when you expect um, to release a new calibration files? So should we expect a release faster than the release of data or we should expect with the ERAS one now? I, I think that, that you should expect that to be the rest one, not before, I think, uh, because we are still working. I mean, the, some of the latest energy calibration were just implemented this week. So uh, it, it's a never ending work, as you know. M I may be wrong, okay, but uh, right now the baseline is to do it uh, together with the rest one. With respect to the cross calibration, um, I mean, as you know, I, I mentioned before, out of the seven camera, two are intrinsically different because of this light leak, which is a time dependent effect and it's pretty, pretty difficult to calibrate, uh, especially if you're interested really in detailed spectroscopy below 0.7, 0 0.8 HD. Um, but the other five are quite comparable. I mean, I don't know the details, but I, I think there is quite good compatibility and stability. The comparison with XMM and Chandra is ongoing. I mean, we have a few more clusters that we observed in CalPV. Uh, we are writing papers about them. Um, I mean, I don't, you can definitely ask Thomas Reitrich or Ezra in the detail, but uh, we are finding some, uh, we are finding quite good uh, flux calibration. Uh, uh, our big netting and PSF model is good enough that we are getting very good profiles for these clusters, very good agreement within the OZIT XMM. But on the temperature comparison, we clearly see uh, some offset the hotter the cluster we are looking at. And this inevitably has to do with the different band paths between OZIT and XMM Newton. And probably eventually, I think, I suspect, uh, any multi-temperature structure will will, um, will give you the kind of offset we are seeing. At the lowest temperature, we don't see that much of an offset, but for hotter cluster, we do. Now, the, in, the, in the sense of Zeta measuring uh, slightly lower temperatures. Don't let me, don't, I, I shouldn't try to quantify just because I don't want to say things that are wrong. There are papers in preparation with that. Thanks. And Massimo, I think there is a, a hands on. Uh, yes, a curiosity about um, if you can, could tell us a little bit more about the galactic center. So, do you see some uh, unexpected uh, transients or so? Or do you expect uh, uh, results uh, that could help us or understanding, for example, if the, the bubbles are produced, uh, are generated uh, really from Sagittarius Z star, uh, past activity, or from uh, more uh, diffuse starburst, uh, extended starburst origin. And I mean, what are you uh, seeing in the galactic center? What are your expectations? Okay. Um, well, first of all, because we are very soft and we have a reduced sensitivity above 2 kV, of course, it's hard for us to peer to look into the galactic center, right? The absorption is killing us a lot. Um, well, on terms of large scale diffuse emission, um, we cannot really com compete with the large XMM and Chandra programs. Uh, there was a paper two days ago, actually, uh, from the Russian team that just had a data point in time and on the reflection nebulae on, on Sagittarius B. Uh, so just simply because we add an observation at later time. Um, but it's nothing revolutionary new. And in terms of transient, of course, we see transient everywhere. I don't think we, we have seen anything uh, peculiar very close to the galactic center. But part of it is also due to the veil of obscuration in front of it. Um, and as far as the origin of the bubbles, I think the next task for us is to really understand their 3D structure. Because as you know, there is a long-standing debate about the North Polar Spool, whether this is local or at the galactic center. Uh, it, it may be that you need some more complex configuration with some overlapping. Uh, so what we are doing right now, I can show you one slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of data we are looking at, 
the, we are looking at spectra of the diffuse emission point source subtracted at various locations inside the bubbles, outside the bubbles. So this is just a simple comparison between the spectrum extracted over a three by three square degree region inside the bubble, it is the black, and outside the bubble is the red. You clearly see the lack of oxygen. So there are clearly different temperatures. So we want to study temperature, metallicity, uh, and whether it's one, one phase or two phase. For that, of course, we are very interested in calibrating our background very accurately at the lowest possible energies. That's why it's taking so long. But you know, we will have this kind of spectra. Essentially, uh, we can tessellate the entire sky with this kind of spectra, and that will help us getting a better idea of the 3D structure of the bubbles.